Thank you, Ma. Yes, good afternoon, Ma. Inky, good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, ma. Good afternoon, ma. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Okay. The president is just okay. He's in. Welcome. Okay. <laughs> well done. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Dr. Briggs. Good afternoon, Dr. Koji. Welcome, Madam President. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I'm joining uh, four minutes late. I'm sorry. Um. I don't know, is our speaker for today around? Yes, he's on board. Okay. Around. Okay. And uh, your Dr. Briggs, you are moderating for us. Yes. Okay. I'm going to talk for a few minutes um, after we take questions for the tonight. I'm going to talk generally for a few minutes. Um, if that will be okay by you. Madam Moderator, if that will be okay. Am I permitted? Yes. Okay. All yes, right. please go on. Uh, no, let's start. I said after Dr. Sinaike's presentation and the question and answer session, um, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, just general talks about the exams. Okay, so we start off. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. The president and members of ESCO and all members of NSA. You are welcome to the third webinar session of the NSA. And we are most delighted to have in our midst here, Dr. Babatunde Oshinaike, who is um, going to talk to us on perioperative arrhythmias. Um, Dr. Oshinaike is one of us, a consultant, um, anesthetist who trained at the University of um, Ife, Obafemi Aulawa University, Ile Ife. And um, he proceeded from there to do his residency in anesthesia at the University College Hospital, Libado obtaining the fellowship of the National Postgraduate Medical College in May 20, 2004. He had additional training in cardiac anesthesia and intensive care at the Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases, Chennai, India. And he's also a critical care research associate of the Royal London Hospital, Whitechapel, London. Um, he has published several scientific papers in anesthesia and critical care and has presented many papers at local and international conferences. He coordinated the International Surgical Outcome Study in Nigeria, and also is an international um, collaborator on um, this study on postoperative surgical outcomes. He's the principal investigator for the recently published Nigerian Surgical Outcome Study, um, and he's currently a reader in the Department of Anesthesia, University of Ibadan, and consultant anesthetist and intensivist at the same, um, at University College Hospital, Libado. Um, Dr. Oshinaike was a past secretary of Nigerian Society of Anesthetists and is the present vice president of the Inter um, Critical Care Society of Nigeria. 
you can be assured that um, this subject is um, well suited to talk to us on this subject with his vast experience. I therefore present to you Dr. Batunde Oshinaike. Welcome, Dr. Oshinaike, to this platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma, uh, Dr. Briggs. I want to thank NSA for giving me this opportunity to bring this presentation to us. Um, I'm so delighted. I don't know if my screen is available now. Yes, you can begin to share your screen. Okay, I'm sharing already. Yes, yes we can see. Okay, it's not full screen yet. Okay, okay. So is it full screen now? Yes, yes sir. Okay, once again, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. Uh, hopefully between the next uh, 45 minutes one hour, I'll be talking on um, preoperative arrhythmias and management. Um, I hope we'll be able to uh, gain quite a lot in this presentation. Our learning objectives will include, um, we'll try and provide an overview of the different types of arrhythmia, uh, preoperative arrhythmia. And then we also try to elucidate on the pathogenesis of this arrhythmia and their diagnosis. And also we'll provide current treatment protocols um, for the preoperative arrhythmia. I'm going to use this outline introduce, give us some incidents, local reports, look at normal cardiac conduction, uh, mechanism of arrhythmogenesis, and as it is listed there. So to introduce this uh, presentation, I'm sure we all know that arrhythmia is defined as abnormality of cardiac rate, rhythm, or conduction. And if you're talking of perioperative cardiovascular problems, arrhythmia is uh, is very common, is one of the very common, is, in fact, is the most frequent perioperative cardiovascular abnormality you see in patients having both cardiac and non-cardiac surgery. Uh, at times, you might have relatively minor fluctuation in cardiovascular or immunodynamic parameters due to arrhythmias, but the challenge is that those minor fluctuations can end up having long-term significant implications on the patient. And that's why we need to have a good understanding as anesthetist of what these arrhythmias are, their pathophysiology, and how we should manage or how we can manage these common cardiac arrhythmias. Um, Averagely, from reports, about 60% um, of uh, procedures during general anesthesia, you have patients having arrhythmia. Unfortunately, these are not really detected or because we are not, is either patients are not being monitored or we are not really um, watchful and seeing these arrhythmias when they happen. Um, when we offer intermittent CG monitoring, it's said to vary from about 16 to about 16 to 60 percent. And um, when you offer continuous auto monitoring in the perioperative period for patient undergoing non cardiac surgery, it's said to be up to 19, 89 percent. In fact, in cardiac surgery, the incident is said to be over 90 percent. Uh, during cardiac surgery. Uh, as we go on, we'll try to understand why that happens. I will share these two reports. Uh, one is uh, uh, tied to ECD changes in the elderly urology patient during preoperative assessment in Ibadan, mm -hmm. Nigeria. It was a paper published in the um, Journal of Anesthesia and Clinical Research by Emily Awana and uh, Abiodun at, at, at the room. What were they interested in? They wanted to see the ECD changes in these elderly patients. And um, they looked at 60 elderly patients. What they found was that um, about 70% uh, of patients actually had abnormal ECG. 70% had abnormal ECG. And among these abnormal ECGs, you had uh, sinus cycardia, sinus bradycardia, um, right bronchial branch block. You have atrial fibrillation, PVCs, and all of that. So just to let us know that what we are talking about is something that is not far-fetched, is not, is not something that you have to, I mean, strain to look for or to get to see, is actually with us, is so much around us. The other one is the 
paper published by Ghani and Eguma in Annals of African Medicine in 2005, they reported five cases of ventricular bigemini. And in their paper, they discovered that five of their patients had this ventricular bigemini and the, the causes were traced to hypokalemia, inadequate analgesia, old age, um, the myocardial business to, to halotain, and they treated the patient successfully. Also pointing to the fact that these things are actually around us. So it's not something we should think uh, um, is, 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 uh, is not common. It's quite around us. If you look for them, you will see them. Now, let's look at the normal cardiac conduction because this is important to recognizing the arrhythmia and understanding the pathogenesis of an arrhythmia. Um, we all know that um, the sinoatrial node, that's the impulse generator, that's where impulse generator starts from and goes on to the atrioventricular node. And from there, it goes on to the bundle of eases here. Then you have the left bundle branch and right bundle branch, okay? Then you don't have the Purkinje fibers. So if you have any issues around the SA node or the AV node or around this um, electrical conducting system, one can end up with arrhythmia uh, that can actually affect patient interoperatively. Uh, this shows a cardiac con action potential. This is actually a uh, ventricular action potential because the atria actual potential is, is not like this, but because the uh, ventricles actually contribute so much to the cardiac output. So that's why we are referring to the um, uh, ventricular action potential uh, as, a, as a cardiac action potential. So you have the different phases from phase one to four. Phase one is where you have depolarization. And from phase one, two, and three, you, the depolarization continues phase one and two. Then you have repolarization in phase three and you have phase four resting phase. It's important to state that um, from phase one to phase three actually corresponds to the QT, uh, QT interval in the um, um, ECG um, waveform. Uh, we're going to see that later too. So this is the normal ECG, 12 bit ECG that we always request for and see before surgery and shows the lead one, two, three, uh, the AVR, AVL, and AVF. These are the limb leads. Then you have the precordial leads, uh, V1 to V6. And as you will see, um, for a normal ECG, you expect a normal sinus reading where you have um, the ratio really should be about 60 to 100. The rhythm is regular. You have a P wave occurring before the QRS, okay? And the PR interval is supposed to be between 0 0.12 and 0 0.2. And the QRS complex, the duration should not be more than, uh, should be less than 0 0.12. This is a normal sinus rhythm. So as we'll be seeing later, most of these arrhythmias uh, deviate from this. A normal cardiac cycle, you have the P wave. As I've shown you, the P wave represents atrial depolarization and the PR interval, um, okay, the PR interval, that's the time it takes for the, the ventricles also to get depolarized, okay? Then you have the QRS, which is ventricular depolarization. Then the T wave is ventricular depolarization. Uh, atrial depolarization, actually that's when you have the atrium contracting. Similarly, you have the ventricle contracting here. And when ventricle repolarizes, it's relaxing to taking blood from the atrium. And the quit interval is the time taken for the vent for ventricular depolarization and repolarization. That's the contraction and relaxation of the ventricles. Then these are some normal values we should be familiar with, the heart rate, PR interval, QRS interval. The SNO discharge, the discharge is at about uh, 60 to 100 per minute. So, when everything is intact, uh, there is no um, abnormality around the SNO. You expect the artery to be between 16 and 100. But when you have issues, maybe in our block, for example, uh, you have the AV node only discharging. There, if there is blockage of conduction from the SNO to the AV, and you have those AV node discharging, the rate will be from 40 to 60. And if it's only the ventricle, maybe you have a complete heart block and 
the AV node is actually not communicating with the ventricles, you might have just the rates between 20 to 40. And at that time, uh, one will need to intervene as we'll see later. So what are the mechanisms of arrhythmogenesis? Uh, there are four mechanisms that have been identified. You can have an injury or damage to the cardiac conduction system. Um, all those part with uh, the electrical conductive systems, uh, systems I mentioned. And if you have damage to this, it's going to, I mean, patient will end up with one form of conduction problem or the other. You also have what is called re-entry, where you have presence of a pathologic circuit of electrical impulse around the functional anatomical loop. Okay, like you seen in Wolf Parkinson White, where you have congenital presence of some pathological circuit that allows electrical conduction around in the normal, I mean, a loop that the patient has, and this ends, ends up giving patient one form of a, a form of arrhythmia. Then automaticity, automaticity is another one where you have abnormal depolarization of the atrium or ventricle ventricular muscle during periods of actual potential. So, uh, the, apart from the normal pot actual potential that is generated, you just have the act going into, I mean, the atrium of the ventricle getting depolarized on its own again, apart from the uh, pattern of uh, normal depolarization, this also leading to one form of arrhythmia or the other. Then mutation in the ion channels, okay? Because the ion channels are uh, in the, um, let me just show us this. In this, in the cardiac anxious potential, you will see that you have various exchange or various uh, movement of ions. I mean, so I mean, calcium, sodium going out here potassium coming in, calcium going out. So all this, you can have mutations of these ion channels leading to um, uh, arrhythmia, okay? Because the ion channels are responsible for depolarization. So if you have mutations in the ion channels, um, in some patients, you can end up with arrhythmias in this patient. Now, we need to look at the predisposing factors for preoperative, uh, perioperative arrhythmias. And it could be patient-related factors, anesthesia-related or surgery-related factors. It's important to understand that um, arrhythmias uh, usually have things, um, I mean, things that points to their development, that if one can actually attend to them, you may not have arrhythmias. And that's why oftentimes we don't, um, we, 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 we don't see this or we don't really look out for them because we feel, um, I mean, uh, maybe we think we've done all we, we need to, have to, to, to do. But as we see, when you have pre-existing cardiac disease in some patients that you have not really optimized, then one may be looking for, or uh, I mean, you will, be, you will expect to have arrhythmias in this patient intraoperatively. A patient with ischemic heart disease, for example, uh, or hypertensive heart disease, there's a possibility of, I mean, prior myocardial ischemia in them or some form of cardiac injury that uh, maybe hypoxemia or undue uh, sympathetic stimulation intraoperatively will predispose the patient to develop one form of arrhythmia or the other. Some patient with CNS disease, uh, uh, may patient with a subarachnoid hemorrhage may show some ECG abnormalities like changes in QT intervals. Some old patients, elderly patients, actually have preoperative uh, and postoperative atrial fibrillation, okay? And these are patients one need to really attend to uh, before uh, surgery or after surgery. Electrolyte imbalance um, and atri abnormal arterial blood gases can also be patient-related factors that can predispose a patient to developing perioperative arrhythmia, anemia, dehydration. These are some electrolyte derangements and the ECG changes. Uh, and this is important because most times we request for these investigations. It's not just requesting, we should know that um, abnormality in these results can actually predispose patient to perioperative arrhythmias. Hypokalemia can predispose, uh, predispose our patient to premature atrial ventricular beats, sinus bradycardia, and then uh, ventricular tachycardia. Similarly, hyperkalemia, you can have bundle branch block, okay? Uh, hypomagnesemia, you can have white KRS complex, increasing the risk of developing to say the point A, uh, which is a quite, uh, uh, is, a, is a dangerous arrhythmia that uh, one would not want to see in his or her patient. Hypermagnesemia can cause conduction defects, hypocalcemia, prolonged kidney interval, hypercalcemia, shorting myocardial action potential. So these electrolytes are associated with one form of 
OCD changes or arrhythmia of the other. Now, anesthesia is related factors. Um, trachea intubation is, is a very troublesome one here because oftentimes if a patient is not well anesthetized at induction, uh, you can have excessive catecholamine releases causing sinus trachycardia that may predispose patients to developing even um, uh, arrhythmias that are worse than just sinus trachycardia. So it's important that one should know this as an anesthetist. Uh, also, arrhythmias can develop in the presence of a variety of tri triggering agents and clinical situations. Uh, as I said, I catecholamine means maybe a patient has been, uh, uh, wound has been infiltrated with adrenaline, and you're also using allotane. Uh, okay, or, or end for rain. So this can predispose your patient to developing uh, arrhythmias. Uh, use of local anesthesia, uh, usually what bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias predominates here. So if you are if you get uh, if you end up using an overdose of local anesthetics, you may end up causing a patient developing bradyarrhythmias. arrhythmias. Uh, during the central venous cannulation, if you push your catheter too far into the right atrium, you may end up developing some uh, PVCs, okay? And so similarly, when you put pressure on the um, carotid sinus, maybe during that procedure or at any other time, you can end up slowing down the heart, causing the sinus bradycardia uh, in your patient. So these are some of the other factors that may end up uh, leading to perioperative arrhythmia. Now, uh, some of our drugs actually uh, also lead to some form of arrhythmia or the other. Like inhalational anesthetic um, uh, have effect on calcium, antagonizes calcium, and increases the polarization of, in the Purkinje fibers. So this may end up causing atrioventricular HC crony. Propofol, can, we know, can cause sinus bradycardia. Snycholine also can also cause sinus bradycardia, and sometimes can lead to HC stolen. Then pancuronium, um, vecuronium, all these can lead to sinus trachycardia. Uh, Look at as I said, can lead to um, um, sinus bradycardia as well. Then alpha-2 agonists can also lead to sympathetic blockade causing sinus bradycardia. Now let's go at the surgery-related factors. Um, cardiac surgery is notorious here. Uh, during cardiac surgery, especially, you know, in, in, when I was uh, in talking about the incidents, I mentioned that in almost 90% or more of cardiac surgical cases, you have arrhythmia. And that is because most of the time when you do open heart surgery, you I mean, you, you clamp the aorta uh, to when you want to I mean, put your patient on pump, you clamp the aorta at a point just above the aortic root. And when the surgery is ending, you release that clamp. And when you release that clamp, there's a sudden release of blood out of the uh, aorta, I mean, out of the heart. And that predisposes the patient to arrhythmia. Most of the time, patients develop ventricular fibrillation and uh, is very common, it's very common. And as anesthetists or cardiac anesthetists or, I mean, the surgeon, they know this will happen and they, they are always ready to manage that. For non-cardiac surgery, vagus, vagus stimulation due to traction on the peritoneum can lead to sinus bricada, even can lead to resistole, okay? Then surgical manipulation like retraction of the heart, maybe during chest procedure, thoracic procedures, uh, or, or close cardiac surgery, you can be manipulating or pushing the heart and this can predispose the patient developing a ventricular tachycardia or other forms of uh, PVCs. Then oculocardial reflex, we know this pressure on the eye, eyeball also can predispose a patient to developing a, a bradycardia. Now, we need to diagnose uh, this arrhythmia and um, preoperative diagnosis is so important. And that means that uh, preoperatively, we need to I mean, uh, find out while examining a patient or reviewing a patient to determine if the patient has arrhythmias preoperatively or th ask things that can predispose to arrhythmia pre um, intraoperatively and such is uh, taken care of. As I'll talk, I'll talk more about that when I talk uh, about management. Now for diagnosis of arrhythmia, definitely you need an ECG uh, most of the time. Okay, uh, though occasionally you might need, you might just do that clinically, but most of the time you need ECG, uh, especially in the, in the, in the intraoperative setting. Um, both leads two and five are very useful for this. And these are the two, uh, these are two leads that we can actually monitor um, even intraoperatively, I mean, when we are 
having our routine uh, routine surgeries. Then let me sound a note of warning that artifacts at times can actually mimic ventricular tachycardia. So especially when patient, uh, when the surgeons are using a, a electrocautery, or maybe there's um, uh, you have pacemaker in place, you, this might mimic a ventricular tachycardia or VF. But in our monitors, most of our monitors have the um, capacity of actually featuring this um, interference. Okay, so we just set the monitor in monitor mode rather than a diagnostic mode. So if you set a monitor, monitor filter, it can filter up some of these uh, interferences you get from agriculture, and you can actually see your ECG tracing the way they are, they are exactly. Now, this just shows, um, give us an idea, of if you do an ECG preoperatively or intraoperatively, um, the different leads actually gives you an idea of the, uh, the different parts of the heart you are looking at. For example, if you want to look at the inferior uh, uh, part of the heart, you'll be looking at lead two, lead three, and AVF. The lateral part you'll be looking at one, AVL, AVL, V5, and V6s, and V6. Similarly, anterior, V3, and V4, then septal, V1. So with this, if, you, if the abnormalities in these leads, you know where the issues are. And um, uh, though um, this will benefit more the cardiologist, but even as anesthetist, intraoperatively, you can have an idea where the problem is. And especially if uh, you, uh, you have issues, uh, maybe in terms of, uh, I mean, perfusion of a patient intraoperatively or persistent type of hypotension. Now, now let's identify these arrhythmias uh, that we're talking about. They are classified into two main groups. You have the bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias and the tachyarrhythmias. arrhythmias. Uh, uh, under the bradyarrhythmia, arrhythmia, you have the sinus bradycardia, then the different forms of heart block. Then under the tachyarrhythmia, arrhythmia, you have the narrow complex, uh, uh, the tachyarrhythmia, then the wide complex, okay? So let's look at them. Um, under the bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias, you have sinus bradycardia. I mentioned the, it, it's quite common, especially when we use some of our anesthetics, and when we do some of our procedures, and uh, it's, it's not dangerous arrhythmia. Uh, the heart rate is below 60, it's regular, the rhythm is regular. You have your P wave coming before the QRS complex. The PR interval is fine, the QRS interval is fine. Okay, the only thing here is that you have the heart rate below 60. And let me just note here that if you look at this, calculating your heart rate shouldn't be a big deal. If you count the number of big boxes you have, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, okay, around six or so. If you divide 300 over six, uh, that should be giving you around 50. So if you, from the R wave to the other R wave, the number of big boxes you have, if you divide that by uh, divide uh, 300 by that, you should get the number of uh, the heart rate of your patient. So that's sinus bradycardia. Uh, causes, as we said, um, oculocardial reflex, select laser stimulation, laryngoscopy at times. Uh, even in children, hypoxemia, uh, we know that, then beta blockers and the cardiac channel blockers, opioids, all these can cause hypo, uh, sinus bradycardia. Um, hypothyroidism, hypothalamia, and it could be normal in I mean, the so-called athletic heart syndrome where you have the artery below 60 or around 60 in apparently normal individuals. Or it could be because uh, of SNO disease or ischemia. Now, the other sinus uh, arrhythmia, I mean, sinus bradycardia includes the heart blocks, okay? You have first degree heart block where the P wave is there for every QRS. The rhythm is regular, but the heart rate um, may be slow or normal. The challenge here is you have prolonged PR interval, okay? And it's caused commonly by um, increased vigor tone inferior wall and my, myocarditis. Uh, oftentimes it's uh, asymptomatic and doesn't really require treatment, okay? So you just have prolonged, uh, I mean, PR interval, okay? Just prolonged, okay? So that is greater than the 0.2. So, but apart from that, it's, uh, the other things are fine. Then you have the sinus, I mean, second degree heart block, Mobius types two, we can batch. And here, the P waves, uh, some P waves are not followed by query complexity. Rhythm is regular. The rate um, might be normal at times, okay? But you have prolonged PR interval, 
unless QRS is blocked completely. So you have uh, the rate slow or maybe normal. The rhythm is regular. Uh, the P wave is present, but some may not be followed by uh, QRS uh, complex. And the PR interval is progressively longer, okay? You can look at it, look at it here, look at it here. So progressively longer, okay? And the QRS is, is actually okay. Uh, this is uh, Mobius type one. Then you, the Mobius type two, where you have uh, many more P waves than the QRS complexes. And um, the HR rate could be normal, but the ventricular rate is actually low. I mean, I mean, much is lower, most of the time lower than the atrial rate. Um, then the AV node normally conducts some bits while blocking others. Okay, that's why at times you might have uh, the rate becoming normal. But when most of the uh, bits are not are, are, are blocked, you are going to have the rate becoming much lower uh, than the atrial rate. Here, the challenge in the Mobis type two um, is that you have, it can progress to a complete hard block. So you can have two to three P wave before having QRX, okay? And the rhythm is regular or irregular. And usually it's, you have slow, the heart rate is actually slow. Then you have the third degree hard block where you have, uh, there are more P waves than QRX. I mean, you don't, I mean, most of the uh, uh, impulses from the P waves are not uh, conducted from the sinoatrial node are not conducted uh, through the AV node. And um, the ventricular rates usually, as we mentioned earlier, is, most of the time they are lower than 60, okay? The, there is a complete block at the AV node and there's no relationship between P waves and the QRX uh, complex. So, you, you, I mean, this, these are uh, P waves so distant from, from the, it's like, do your own, I do my own. That's what happens in third degree at block. The rate is low, uh, maybe regular, P wave present, but no correlation with queries. At times maybe eating uh, in the, uh, under the, just as part of the QRS complex. Then let's go to the tachyarrhythmias, the narrow complex and the wide complex. The narrow complex um, tachyarrhythmias include sinus tachycardia, where the heart rate is more than 100 per minute. Uh, we have prolonged tachycardia. Um, in some patients, may lead to ischemia, especially in coronary artery disease patients. So it's not just, um, uh, you, you, you might not just say there's no problem with sinus tachycardia, because if you get too prolonged, you might actually be exposed with patients to uh, ischemic uh, and myocardial ischemia. So anemia, hypovolemia, fever, pacabia, all this may cause uh, sinus tachycardia. So you have the, the, you can see the heart rate. So you just have, this one is, I mean, just about over, over 100, just, because just two big um, box. So it's quite fast, regular. You have P wave, yeah, before the QRX, okay? And the PR interval is fine, QRX also is fine, but the heart rate is fast here. Yeah. Then you have the atrial, atrial premature beat or premature atrial contraction, PACs. This also is, is, is about 10% of interoperative arrhythmias, though we, uh, we might not see this if we don't really look out for them. It's commonly seen. Uh, yeah, we can say no, nothing. I, it's not an emergency, you understand? Hyperthyroidism. Oh, can be seen with hyperthyroidism or OMI. That one is you, not you, you can have early or abnormal PWs, usually, but not always followed by normal PRS, the QRS complex. So this, uh, okay, the heart rate might not be, might not be easy to calculate the heart rate. Um, the rhythm is regular. The P wave is premature, abnormal, or could be hidden inside the QRS complex. Um, at times for this, you might actually do a carotid massage to slow down the ventricular rate so that you can actually see the, the P wave. Then the PR interval is normal and the PR is, is normal as well. Then you have supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, this this uh, refers to sustained non sinus related acceleration of the cardiac rhythm originating above the AV node. If the impulse is from the eight sinoatrial node, it can be you can it can be referred to as sinus tachycardia uh, or sinoatrial reentrant tachycardia or atrial flutter. If the impulse is from the atrial myocardium itself, you can, what you have is ectopic unifocal tachycardia. 
multifocal atrial tachycardia or atrial flutter fibrillation. So when, I mean, the, uh, the, if the arrhythmia is originating above the AV node, oftentimes refer to them as supraventricular tachycardia, but depending on where it's actually originating from. You can follow some heart diseases, um, thyroid toxicosis and others. So atrial tachycardia is a form, I mean, of the supraventricular tachycardia. Uh, it's uh, non proxima You have narrow QRS reading with retrograde or non apparent P waves at a rate of less than 70 beats per minute. Uh, that's the atrial rate. And um, if faster, usually can be, you can have it, the rate, ventricular rate becoming, uh, sorry, the atrial rate becoming, going close to about 130, okay? And if you, if you remember that the atrium contributes about 30% to the cardiac output. So when you have the atrium is contracting fast, you won't, it might not have, you won't have enough time. Um, the heart might not empty. I mean, the color culture might not be adequate because you are not getting enough um, uh, input from the atrium. And so in some patients, you can have um, hypotension as a result of this atrial tachycardia. So this is what you have, okay? This is, it's been normal, normal here, but suddenly you have the atrial tachycardia uh, coming on here. Then you have atrial flutter, usually as well with organic ischemic heart disease. The atrial rate is between 250 to 400. I mean, the atrium is beating very fast here, okay? Usually around 300. And uh, most often you can have uh, every second flutter bit giving rise to a ventricular rate, okay? So with a ventricular rate of, so you can have atrial uh, rate of about 300, ventricular rate of about uh, uh, 150. And similarly here, the same challenge is that you won't have enough blood from the atrium um, because it's not the contraction is, is not that effective and it's so rapid. And the ECG, ECG, this is what you see on ECG. You have sawtooth P wave, okay? Classical sawtooth P wave, that's what you see. And the rhythm is irregular. But we, we, what you have here is actually a regularly irregular rhythm, okay? Unlike what you have in the atrial fibrillation that is irregularly irregular reading, okay? And when you palpate actually the pulse, you're going to feel something like that. So now atrial fibrillation, this is quite common in the preoperative setting, um, often follow raised atrial pressure, maybe following a, a thoracic injury or cardiac surgery, okay? Inflammation of the atrium or inflammation of the, of the I mean, if you have edema, that is uh, around the heart, maybe uh, also limiting the, the heart, this may end up leading to um, atrial fibrillation. Often as well with cardiac diseases, um, such as mitral valve disease or coronary artery disease, it can also be seen with uh, hyperthyroidism. I can be up to, can see up to 60% of patients undergoing myocardial revascularization. And okay, let me say that it peaks on the third postoperative day. So um, it's very common to see it in the post of around the third day when the inflammatory response to the surgery is actually uh, uh, greatest. Now, oh, sorry. Then you have, um, okay, I think that's the, that's the atrial fibrillation. I said it's very, you have irregular uh, pulse. The ECG, you have fine, very wavy, uh, you know, wavy. Uh, if you are watching uh, the surgery, um, if you are watching an open heart surgery, you will appreciate how the atrium is actually fibrillating. Ineffective conduction, okay? I mean, effective contraction, and it's actually going very fast. So the reading is very regular. And when you palpate the pulse of this patient, it's actually irregularly irregular. And this other one, fourth Parkinson white syndrome, uh, which may, is not really. Uh, um, um, an arrhythmia uh, that you see intraoperatively, but it's something that can predispose to patient developing some dangerous arrhythmias intraoperatively. Often you have patients developing these congenital problems where they have abnorm ab abnormal focus in the heart, where some uh, abnormal impulse is being generated. And if this patient is exposed to surgery unknowingly, I, I, I won't forget a patient we had who had this syndrome, but it was later when we, um, 
uh, when the patient developed a cardiac arrest on the table that we're able to see something that we couldn't see before. And what is that? They have this um, delta wave at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the QRS complex, okay? This lowering up, this lowering of the QRS around here, that is the, that is the delta wave. And that was what we observed later after the patient suffered a cardiac arrest at induction. This syndrome is quite dangerous if it's not identified preoperatively uh, because your anesthetic agent can actually predispose the patient to sudden cardiac arrest. Now, in the white KRS complex tachycardias, here the KRS is actually greater than uh, the time, is duration is greater than 0.12 seconds. Uh, the force is premature ventricular contraction. Uh, you have ectopic beak, uh, the ectopic beat not preceded by P wave. Uh, that's the, the QRS is not preceded by P wave, and you have irregular rhythm because of the ectopic beat. The QRS is wide and bizarre, okay? So let's look at them. So you have something like this. You can, the, the QRS is, uh, is, is quite something like this. This is the normal one. This is the normal one. See something coming up here, something coming up here, okay? It's bizarre compared to what you've been having, okay? You have irregular rhythm. No P waves are still with the premature beat, okay, and the QRS is white. That's ventilar, a premature ventilar contraction. And you have different types. You can be unifocal or multifocal. Unifocal, that is originating from the same area uh, of the ventricle and distinguished by the same morphology. Something like this. Look at this PVC here. Look at this PVC. You can see they are similar. So this is unifocal. And it can be multifocal, originating from different areas of ventricle, screened by different morphology. Look at this and look at that. Okay, that tells you there are different parts of the of the heart. And you have uh, uh, those that are called you call by Gemini. If you have a PBC occurring after, I mean occurring every other beat. Okay, this one you have a normal beat. You have another one. So that is a by Gemini. And you can also have. Uh, bigeminy is actually common with allotane. And you can also have trigeminy or quadrigeminy. If you have one, uh, uh, one or two P uh, PVC occurring before a normal uh, QRS, or you have uh, one uh, QRS, normal QRS, and you have two abnormal uh, uh, QRS uh, uh, PVC. So it could be trigeminy or, or quadrigeminy. Now, you have some dangerous PVCs, like the R on T, where you have the the, the, the peak of the uh, PVC occurring, I mean, the PVC is occurring on the peak of the T wave of the preceding uh, 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 beat, okay? And that can predispose your patient to developing ventricular fibrillation. And you can have run of PVCs, three or more. When you have run of PVCs like this, then you should be careful. That means something is going to happen soon if you don't take care. So uh, it's important to know when you have six or more PVCs per minute, and repetitive or multifocal forms, there's increased risk of developing life-threatening arrhythmia like eventual fibrillation. So you must note something sinister is really going to happen soon. Now, ventral tachycardia is also there. Uh, you have, uh, when you have uh, three of, I mean, more than three runs of uh, PVC, you are actually going to be having ventral tachycardia, no discernible P waves with QRS, rhythm is regular, the atrium cannot be determined, but the ventricular rate is quite high, 150 or more. And the challenge with this, just as the atrial fibrillation, is that the, the heart is not able to uh, relax at all, okay? And you won't have, the cardiac capital is going to be compromised in this because the heart is not going to take um, uh, blood, uh, which it should, it should take during that too, but the heart is not really relaxing uh, at all. So that's the challenge with ventral tachycardia. So you have, you have runs of VT going all the way. VTAC is potentially life-threatening, okay? And one actually uh, need to attend to that. So you can also have monomorphic or polymorphic uh, uh, ventral tachycardia. I need to move on because of my time. Now you have to say the point A, that is the, 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 the uh, waveform is twisting around a point, okay? Uh, something like this, okay? And this is actually, is a, is a form of ventral tachycardia Okay, but it's a bit different in the terms of the, uh, the waveform. And uh, the challenge with this is that it can actually progress easily to ventricular fibrillation. Um, 
Now, the final one is Renlaf Revelation. Before I go to go to talk about management, this is a cardiac arrest rhythm, okay? And usually from ischemic myocardium or an aberrant uh, foci uh, in the heart, okay? And no defined coarse complex. Everything is, is shapeless. You have, I mean, disorderliness in the waveform, okay? And when you see something like this, you know there's, there's a problem. Now, how do you go about managing this patient? Management is uh, divided into three preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. For preoperative care, it's important to know that we can prevent some of this arrhythmia if we offer good preoperative uh, care to our patient. During history taking, you must take, take good history, any history of chest pain, palpitation, or syncope, and um, that can point to a patient already having some form of arrhythmia. Examination of the patient, especially the, 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 I mean, the heart sounds, and pulse, just putting off your, your fingers on the pulse, you can determine the rate of the pulse, whether it's low, or you can determine the regularity of the pulse, and that might give away the arrhythmia preoperatively. Investigations, here and you preoperatively, uh, we review to you if there are issues with the electrolytes and you, you might need to correct that. ECG, I mean, for patients with cardiac and respiratory diseases, this is mandatory. Or patient, I would suggest patient above 40 should have an ECG because you'll be able to discover some things that you could, maybe you didn't, you missed that during your uh, examination. Preoperative treatment is, is very important. If you can treat some of these issues, electrolyte in, uh, imbalances, or you have arrhythmias you, you identify preoperatively and you treat them, you will reduce so much the incidence of patient or risk of patient developing arrhythmia intraoperatively or postoperatively. You can offer your patient, uh, some patient can actually have catheter ablation therapy. Some patient with uh, identified focus of the of the arrhythmia, uh, maybe a patient with Wolff Parkinson White, or some patient with other forms of arrhythmia. With electrophysiological uh, uh, management, you can actually identify that point of the that part of the heart and actually just uh, I mean scar that area or burn that tissue off, and you will prevent the patient developing a, a arrhythmia. Now, intraoperatively. ECG and reading information should be interpreted with the, in the context, context of the total patient assessment. You must evaluate the patient's symptoms, the clinical signs, oxygenation, ventilation, and everything. It's important to note that um, most times, you most times some of this arrhythmia or most of this arrhythmia might not just you might not need to do anything. Uh, you in terms of offering antiarrhythmic therapy, you might just need to take care of issues with oxygenation, ventilation in your patient, and you will discover that the rhythm will return to, to, to normal. Or you, if there are offending ag agents or offend offending situations, you correct them. Then you discover the arrhythmia, uh, the, the arrhythmia, the rhythm will revert to sinus rhythm. So it's not, it's even the, the number of times you even treat is, uh, um, is, is, I can say it's less than 20% of times when you need, I mean, that you need to really use uh, uh, frank country arrhythmic or to treat arrhythmia uh, perioperatively. Now, if, in unstable and some symptomatic cases, you must assess the patient. Is the arrhythmia causing the patient to be unstable or not? Because at times, it's not the arrhythmia that is the problem. Okay, for example, a patient in septic shock with sinus saccadia of 140 is unstable. Okay, that, that's, this is not a type of patient you want to do electric cardioversion for. That won't help the patient. This is a patient you need to find out is it hypoperfusion? You need to take care of the hypoperfusion hypovolemia or whatever, or anemia or whatever, so that you can bring the heart rate and, and correct, make it a, a, a more sinus. A patient with severe hypoxemia who becomes hypotensive and develops bradycardia. It's not bradycardia that you'll be chasing around. You find out, you, you treat the hypoxemia, you treat the hypotension. And by doing this, your patient's condition will improve. So we must get it clear that is not just running after the arrhythmia or running after the heart rate, but finding out what the problem is and actually treating that problem that led to the arrhythmia. And most times you won't need to treat, uh, uh, to give any uh, antiarrhythmic. Now, this is a, I, I, I got this in, um, 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 in a journal, I found it very useful for us to consider. You know, it is an algorithm if you have a patient developing the arrhythmia that is causing a serious cardiovascular compromise. If you are a junior person, obtain help. Uh, I, I will remember, I'm not sure if the guy, it's possible that our colleague is listening to me now. I remember we, 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 are doing, we are doing a pericardiectomy and our patient developed serious uh, ventilator tachycardia. 
And what did my junior colleague do? He was the only one there. He ran out of the theater looking for me. <laughs> He's trying to obtain the senior help, okay? So you need to assess the anesthetic. Uh, uh, you are giving the patient, is the oxygenation fine? Is ventilation fine? Is the anesthetic too light for surgery? Is there any drug error? You are checked. Assess the surgery. Is there a vigorous stimulation? You know, and see. And you get a 12 lead CG, okay? I know it might be challenging to get a 12 lead CG in theater, but you can print out your your ECG tracing and have a, a close look at it if you think um, uh, you are not comfortable with what you are seeing on the monitor. So we need to analyze the strip. You print out the strip, you analyze the strip. Is there a P wave for every QRS? Is the P wave upright and uniform? Is there one P wave preceding, preceding the QRS complex? Then you look for the rhythm, check the rhythm. Verify the RR interval. The RR interval will give you the atria rate. And I mean, sorry, the, uh, the RI interval will give you the uh, ventricular rate, and the RPP interval will give you the uh, uh, atria rate. Okay. And you, I mean, the, ideally, the RR interval, uh, the atria rate, and the ventricular rate should be the same in a sinus rhythm. Then the rate, you find the rate, count, I mean, as I said, count the P waves for the atria rate and count the um, R wave for the account the QRS uh, to give you the ventricular rate. So you, you analyze the waveform, okay? Now, let's talk about antiarrhythmics. Useful when initial optimi optimization fails, okay? It's, it's, you, it's not the first line, only when the initial optimization fails. And the danger is that they may actually aggravate or produce the arrhythmia themselves. They can depress ventricular contractility and you must use them in caution. So you must determine the type of arrhythmia and the pharmacology, the arrhythmics that you need to, uh, the anti you want to employ, because that's important to actually treat the arrhythmia. Uh, this is a classification of the anti based on the Von Willen's uh, uh, classification. I uh, will move on. Uh, and looking at the cardiac action, I mean, action potential, you can look at some of these uh, uh, antiarrhythmics and where they actually function. Okay, like the class one will be useful around uh, uh, here during the initial depolarization, and the calcium channel blocker will be useful during the uh, late depolarization, and the potassium channel blocker will be useful around the repolarization. And you can see the QRS actually, I told you the other time, this, this phase uh, one to three actually correlates with the um, Q. T interval. That's the, the period of ventricular depolarization and repolarization. Now, managing of bradyarrhythmias, most times you don't need to offer any, any treatment. Um, they don't cause issues, okay? But when you have a patient who is, I mean, you have issues intraoperatively, a patient is decompensating, you may need to, I mean, you might need to use a tropane, uh, 0.5 milligram. Um, and give it three to five minutes to maximum three milligram. And if that is not helping, you can move further to use uh, dopamine or epinephrine. Uh, but as I said, if you can identify the cause of the blood arrhythmia, it's important you attend to that first before treating this patient. This is not too clear, uh, but also I saw this in an update up to date and I found it very useful um, if you want to manage bradyarrhythmia, arrhythmia, you identify and treat potential causes. If you have bigger reflexes, as I said, uh, maybe stretching, you ask the surgeon to relieve the stretch. If they have relieved the, the stretching and the still persistent, you can now treat. If it is due to neuroaxial anesthesia, remember, you can also have that. Uh, Bradcada following spinal anesthesia, you can treat because of high block. If it's due to medications, uh, you can also treat. Um, Let's, let's move on, let's move on. Okay, now, if, it's, if you have persistent bradycardia that does not respond to pharmacology treatment, you, you might actually need to offer that patient the pacing. Uh, temporary pacing, uh, especially transcutaneous pacing can be offered right in theater, right there and then on the table, and that can improve the patient's uh, um, uh, heart rate. Now, the turkey arrhythmias, sinus tachycardia, um, if you, if you are going to manage your patient well, avoid drugs that are going to cause sinus tachycardia. And among them is pancuronium. And if there are issues, if there are drugs you are using causing tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, you have to um, avoid them or find a way to blunt the sympathetic uh, stimulation so that your patient will not have undue sinus. Especially this is important in patients with coronary artery disease preoperatively, okay? If you have sinus tachycardia in them, you can predispose them to further myocardial ischemia, which, is, which could be injurious to this patient. Beta blockers can be employed uh, at times. So if you need to treat, Esmolol is, is one of the preferred drugs. 
has a very short half life of 10 minutes and can give bolus of 500 microgram of, of, of S molon followed by an infusion. And um, you, you, Propanol is not too advisable because it's a long acting uh, drug, but if that's all you have and your patient is having a, a ticardia that is uh, not uh, relieved by all what you have done, you might have to use a propanol. But there is a uh, recently launched drug that people are using other parts of the world. I'm not sure if we have it in this part of the world. It's Landiolol. It's a, it's a very short acting beta blocker. It's cardioselective. Half-life is two to four minutes. And in those of 100 microgram package per minute, bolus, that this can help to relieve a lot of uh, tachycardia that needs to be treated. Or desmetomidine also can be employed. Premature atrial contraction, uh, only treated when it's leading to secondary drain, uh, 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 dangerous arrhythmias. Oftentimes, it's, uh, uh, it's resolved on its own. If you need to treat it, calcium channel blocker or beta blocker will be useful. Supravenular tachycardia usually also, you may not need to treat, but if you have to treat, okay, I want to sign up mass. <clears throat> oh. Can we mute? Can we mute? Can we mute this person? So if you have to treat uh, supramelic tachycardia, carotisinum massage might just be adequate. And I'm sure we are familiar with that. I mean, that's kind of sinus is located just before the uh, carotid artery device into internal and external carotid. It's at the level of the um, upper body of the thyroid cartilage, just media to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. If you palpate the carotid uh, artery there, uh, you, you, if, you not, if you are not careful, you can actually induce a bradycardia in, in, in your patient. So you can offer them carotid sinus massage and that might be enough. But if you have to treat, if it's not uh, abating, you can use adenosine. One challenge with this drug is that it has a very, very short half life of 10 seconds. So you give a, a, a bolus of six milligram and you flush it in fast with about 20 minutes of saline and you can repeat this. Uh, you can give another six milligram if the patient is not, uh, uh, if the arrhythmia is not, uh, is not well, it has, it has not reverted to sinus. But adenosine also should be used uh, cautiously in um, asthmatic patients. Beta blocker can also be used for SVTs, verapamil, amiodarone, all this can be useful in patients with SVT. Atrial flutter, um, uh, especially if it's uh, onsite is less than 48 hours, and um, in patients with hemodynamic instability who are in anesthetized or sedated, Cyclonus DC cardioversion is the best bet here, okay? Um, here, the, it's just like we are defibrillating, but what you are doing is you are synchronizing the, the shock with the R wave, okay? And you are giving, you can give 100 to 200 joules, okay? And with this cardioversion, most times the uh, SVT can be reverted to sinus rhythm. If a patient is not on this size or their sedation is not appropriate, you might just make do with scalp sinus massage. Uh, but if it fails to revert, you can end up using adenosine for this patient. Atrial fibrillation. Um, hello. The, the challenge here. Okay. Yeah. If you if you that can I find precipitating or provoking agents, you should take care of that. If it's recent onset. Control of ventral response is what you need. And that, this can be done with beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, okay? Beta blockers are preferred, especially the small law because they doesn't have as much uh, negative anotropic effect as uh, calcium channel blockers. Then the uh, war passing in white induced tachycardia. Also, vagal maneuver is useful here. Carotid sinus massage can be employed. For stable patients, you can use titrated doses of lecanemide, 50 to 150 milligram or propanolol. And if patient is unstable, you won't give drugs, you will give them uh, do cardio, DC cardioversion in this patient. Now, let me state that in chronic, I, I, didn't, I didn't state that, in chronic, in patient with chronic AF, especially that um, you have identified preoperatively, it's important these patients uh, usually they are on warfarin or any anti uh, some of the anticoagulants, and they must be. They, it must be clear that 
from the echo and everything done that the heart is free. There are no clots in the heart. This is important with patients with chronic AF because if there's a if you have clots in the heart chamber and you the, the cardiovascular patient, you can end up with a systemic or pulmonary embolization of the clot. Okay, so uh, for them, make sure the patient is well prepared. Um, the the rhythm is controlled preoperatively and um, before you, they are taken to theater. That is in patient with chronic atrial fibrillation. It's important to to state that. Now, well, for Wolf Parkinson White. As I mentioned earlier on that, if this patient, if they are identified before surgery, if, they are, if, if, if one can, uh, if they can have ablation therapy, if the surgery is not an emergency, if it's an elective procedure, it's advised that they should have ablation therapy before surgery, before a major surgery, so that you don't predispose them to developing a uh, uh, sudden cardiac arrest. PVCs, usually also no treatment for isolated uh, PVCs, but if it's persistent, if you have multiple PVCs beyond five, that is going to end up becoming a, a, a VF if you are not careful. So for such, you have to quickly offer some treatment. Lidocaine is available as an initial bolus of 1.5 mg per kg. You can get a run an infusion also of lidocaine. And other forms, uh, other drugs in this class, uh, one to three of the antiarrhythmics can also be used. But lidocaine is quite handy and has been so helpful. And I think we can employ that easily. And um, if the patient his condition is not too encouraging. The patient is uh, uh, is not stable, and the blood pressure is low. You might actually do a, a DC cardiovascular in this patient, okay? Instead of uh, um, instead of uh, uh, giving drugs in them. But if you are stable, you can make use of uh, for ventricular tachycardia. Sorry, uh, I think uh, I was talking about PVCs before. For ventricular tachycardia, if they are not stable you do a DC cardioversion. But if they are stable, also just like PVC, you make use of lidocaine in them, followed by infusion if it persists. For recurrent episodes or unresponsive to lidocaine, procainamide can be, can be used, uh, or bretillium or amiodarone, all this can be used. If you've used drugs and the patient is still not responding, you might end up still going back to give uh, DC cardioversion. And for a patient, that has been glad tachycardia that you have other, offered this type of treatment, that surgery should be terminated and the patient should be taken to ICU for further care. So, so the Ponte is um, uh, oftentimes we, you want to employ magnesium because it's been, it's been said that a magnesium uh, um, uh, hypomagnesemia is one of the very common uh, uh, causes of uh, um, to say the Ponte. So you want to give the patient magnesium and also chloride potassium, potassium is low. And if there's hemodynamic collapse, then you might need to, that is the patient is hypotensive, you can't use drug, you might need to do a DC uh, insulinous uh, shock. VF um, is a cardiac arrest regime and CPR must be started fast. Asynchronous external defibrillation using 200 to 360 joules. But if you are doing a cardiac surgery and you can, you have opportunity to uh, defibrillate using an internal padu, you only know more than 10 to 20 joules uh, to defibrillate this patient. And if you are there, if you observe the VF uh, at onset, precordial thumb can be delivered to the, to the chest. This has been found to be useful in reverting some of the rhythm to, um, to, to sinus. So especially if the cause is uh, something that is easily reversible. Uh, uh, you can prevent it, but once it happens, when you have developed the VF, you can only offer uh, CPR and uh, defibrillation to your patient because that patient has suffered actually a cardiac arrest at that point. These are some drugs that you can, can be employed for um, perioperative uh, antiarrhythmia, adenosine, okay, in milligram bolus, if not effective, you can, after two minutes, you can give 12, 12 milligrams, metoprolol, can be used, esmolol also can be used, um, verapamil, all these drugs are short acting drugs and that's why they are, uh, they are used, they are, I mean, they are advocated perioperatively. So the, the important thing is to choose drugs that will be rapid acting. So you can see the effect of that drug right there and then, and you know whether you need to give more or you need to stop. Now it's important to know that some of these antiarrhythmics actually interact with our anesthetics, okay? Like adenosine, it causes vasodilatation, vasodilatation 
on dilute when you give it with isoflurane, okay, and also causes bronchial constriction when you give it with a neostigmine. Amiodarone can cause myocardial depression and vessel dilation with additional agents. Beta blocker we know can cause uh, potentiate uh, um, myocardial depression when you use it with allotene and other inhalation anesthetic. Similarly, uh, calcium channel blocker. So the important thing is to note is to notice that all these drugs, especially those drugs that are uh, used for uh, to treat tachyarrhythmias, they are cardiodepressants. They reduce the rate of the heart. So if you are, and most of our own drugs do are uh, cardiorespiratory depressant drugs. So if you are going to use uh, some of these antiarrhythmics, bear in mind that there's a, there's a tendency for a patient to become more hypotensive. And so you must be willing and plan to manage that. Now in the postoperative period, we need to continuously monitor the ECG of this patient in the PACU, and uh, especially for patients who develop arrhythmia during surgery, okay? We need to continue to monitor the ECG. And we must obtain cardiology consultation. If a patient develop, uh, um, develop a arrhythmia with evidence of myocardial ischemia, or you even up to the end of the surgery, the arrhythmia is yet to resolve, you will need to obtain cardiology consultation after the surgery. It is the, is in the purview of the uh, uh, duty of anesthetist to do that, and not just say and not just push the patient out of theater. But if patient has self limited arrhythmias, sinus arcadia, sinus bradycardia, postural block, uh, and if they don't really persist, it's just um, um, if it's something that is short lived. We might not need we, we might not need to uh, ask for cardiology consultation for this group of patients. Now, in conclusion, uh, I want to say that prevention plays a very huge role, okay? Uh, as we have seen, we can prevent some of these arrhythmias. And if we do that, it will spare us the challenge of looking for uh, drugs, looking for uh, dragging uh, defibrillators out of the theater, and we'll do well with managing most of our patients. So we must recognize the risk factors, select our drugs appropriately, monitor our patients, in the preoperative period properly. So the choice of a drug is very, very important to minimize, especially if you have identified some issues in your patient that, and that I mean, may predispose them to preoperative arrhythmia. Electrolytes should be monitored and corrected when necessary. And the distinction between benign arrhythmia and those that carry risk of sudden death is important because that will determine the patient outcome. If you see a patient having ventricular tachycardia and you don't intervene, then that is dangerous for the patient. Unlike a patient that develops a short-lived PBC, that, that is not a, a problem. But if it's persistent, then you must. So if you, have, if you distinguish between these two, you will have to offer care appropriately. And I want to recommend that there must be comprehensive preoperative expert review uh, when we see patients that are susceptible, patients patient that are predisposed to developing uh, arrhythmia Perioperatively, we should seek for expert review. You have an ECG that you are not so comfortable about, discuss with the cardiologist, okay? Or you feel patient is not stable enough, allow patients some time to be stable before the surgery. ECG monitoring must be mandatory perioperatively. When you are delivering anesthesia, giving anesthesia, ECG monitoring must be mon uh, is mandatory. Defibrillators, uh, it's unfortunate that some of our residents actually are not too familiar or not too conversant with the use of defibrillators. I've seen this over and over again. And this, uh, even in places where you have defibrillators. So it's important we get familiar with defibrillators, uh, especially the managed defibrillators if you have around, or even the, 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 the automated one, okay? Then we should also get familiar with routine antiarrhythmics that we have in theater. Which one do you have in your hospital? Identify them they should be around the theater so that when you need them, you can really reach on to them. It's, there's no doubt that some of them are quite expensive. Then anesthetists must regularly update their knowledge, just as we are doing now, regarding ECG interpretation and arrhythmia management. I want to thank you for this opportunity. Uh, these are my references. I'm sorry if I took more time. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Shinaike, you have not taken too much time. We are fully aware that this is a mega subject and we are happy that you have done real justice to this subject. Thank you, thank you once again. Um, by way of um, summary, I would like to say that Dr. Shinaike has taken us through perioperative arrhythmia 
In fact, bringing out the fact that for us as anesthetists, management of perioperative arrhythmia emphasizes our role as perioperative physicians because it's very key in our practice to identify arrhythmias and be able to manage them, know their etiology, appreciate normal rhythm, and therefore be able to also know abnormal rhythm. He has told us that we need to know the different ranging from bradyarrhythmia to tachyarrhythmias. And he has emphasized that, in fact, some that may appear normal may be very hazardous in patients with coronary artery diseases. Generally, he has stated that um, antiarrhythmics um, and perioperative arrhythmias may be related to patient factors, anesthetic factors, and surgical factors. And we have to identify which is which so that we can give appropriate management. And this management, he has said, can be varied, ranging from us removing the causative factors, if possible, like perhaps some maneuvers under anesthesia or drugs. And he has emphasized that monitoring is very key, that we need to update our knowledge as um, perioperative physicians of ECG um, um, interpretation. Of course, he has also said that cardiology consult may be necessary when we see some liable patients who may have very gross arrhythmias. Um, well, he has said that antiarrhythmics must be handy in our theaters, and we, but we should be conscious of the fact that some antiarrhythmics may also react with um, anesthetic agents. He has gone to also say management may involve using pacing, and he has also made us to know that there's a current drug which has better properties than a small one, which is lambda, lambda law. Of course, cardioversion and then ultimate, which is defibrillation, he has emphasized. And he has concluded that management of perioperative arrhythmias is very key and crucial to patient outcome. And when very necessary, we should carry on the, um, um, the cardiologists in the review. Thank you once again, Dr. Oshinaike. We are very grateful to your exhaustive um, 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 release of knowledge. Um, there are some questions on the chat box, and um, I would like to read some of them out. Please, yeah, um, any please more questions? Um, before we go on, please, may I ask that we should please mute our phones when we are no. not talking? The number no. of people who are bring, bringing up disturbances with their phones on, um, on mute mode. Please mute your phone so that we can have a very smooth session. Thank you very much. So um, I'll be reading some of the questions here. Um, Dr. Shunaike, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I have some questions here. Um, somebody is saying, Dr. Ike is asking that um, for these arrhythmias, which leads are specific to, the question does not appear complete. But I guess he's asking for the kind of um, ECG leads to use. Um, we also have a question that says, in bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias, do we still use 0 0.5 milligram of atropine or one milligram as recommended by ACLS 2020 recommendation? Um, somebody is asking that, um, do, um, um, he just wants to know if Valsava Manova has, has an advantage for awake patients in management of um, SVTs. Another question is asking for the recommended energy juice, energy induced to cardiovert an adult patient. I think we'll stop here and hear your response. Over to you, Dr. Shinaike. Okay. We'll take batches. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first one about leads. I mentioned that lead two and V5 are very useful for us interpretive. So we can make use of that interpretively, okay? The other question on uh, bradyarrhythmia, atropine. I, 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 I don't, um, I think I agree with the, the, the person who has the question. Um, for 2020, I think the recommendation is one milligram. I think I, hope, um, I agree with that, okay? That was the current recommendation. Actually, 0.5 was uh, in 2015 or so. Now, the Vasava, for awake, Vasava and, um, uh, carotid sinus massage, they will end up doing the same thing. They will end, end up just um, helping to uh, induce a prosthetic uh, outflow and bringing down the heart rate. So for awake patient, yes, Vasava can be employed, but interoperatively, you can't do that. So you, I mean, 
I think it's better to go for carotid sinus massage. Though there's a way you can actually try to do that too by forcing, forcibly uh, delivering air um, uh, to the patient. Uh, there's a way we do that <laughs> under anesthesia. But I agree that um, both of them will actually do the same thing. But under anesthesia, carotid sinus massage is recommended. Then the last question about recommended what? Uh, what was that question? The last question. Okay, I think that the last question. The question is saying that um, what is the recommended energy in Jews, cardiovat and adult patients? Okay, okay. Yeah. The, 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 the main thing in cardioversion is synchronization of the uh, wave so that you synchronize it to the R wave. And you can just do that by pressing sync on your defibrillator. You can use up to 200 joules to do that. You can use up to 200 joules to cardiovert. I can use less, 100 to 200. But the important thing is to ensure that it is synchronized to the R wave. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the next batch of questions. Um, Someone is saying, is cardiac ablation for Wolf Parkinson White done in any hospital in Nigeria? That's from Dr. Ago, <laughs> Dr. Ago Daniel. And um, the other one says, um, okay, okay, okay. I think those are all the questions that we have. Most of the comments are thanking you for the presentation. Okay, now, does ketamine cause bradyarrhythmia? arrhythmia? Vecronium is cardiostable is another question. Why is it listed as drugs causing arrhythmias? Mm. Then somebody is saying- Thank you. If VT is cardiac arrest, what other things can be done? That does not seem to be a clear no, question. No, no. VT, VT is not cardiac arrest. VT is not cardiac arrest. VF is cardiac arrest, not VT, okay? So that's, you should just get that clear. Vecuronium can, is, is cardiostable, but has a tendency to cause bradycardia, okay? And uh, we employ it in cardiac surgery because it, instead of uh, using pacronium that will make the heart run so fast and predispose our patient to myocardial ischemia, we want a drug that can slow down the heart. So it's predisposed to causing bradycardia. Ketamine, in small doses, I mean, less than 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milligrams of ketamine has been found to be associated with development of bradycardia, okay? But ordinarily, in standard doses, ketamine will cause tachycardia. I think uh, that should be noted. Now, ablation therapy, I'm not sure whether it's available in any hospital in Nigeria because you need a very good electrophysiology unit to be able to do this ablation therapy because they are the electrophysiologists are the experts that will help in identifying this abdominal focus. And with your catheter, I mean, into the heart, you can now identify that place and now uh, burn off the abdominal focus. So I'm not sure if there's any hospital that offers this therapy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there's one more question here. Somebody is, did you, somebody's talking about vecuronium is cardiostable. Why is it listed as drugs causing arrhythmias? Another one is saying that um, you did not mention labetalol. Yes, I did not mention labetalol because labetalol is, is not a pure beta blocker. It has alpha and beta properties. And so if you want to treat Trachearrhythmias, you need something that is pure bitter that can actually slow down the heart and not cause any other alpha, alpha effect. So that is why la beta law I didn't mention. So if you want to use beta blocker, cardioselective beta blockers are recommended and specific beta, I mean, uh, specific uh, uh, beta blockers that are uh, especially uh, with, uh, that, uh, that has beta effect, no alpha is recommended. So that's why I didn't mention la beta law at all. So Esmolol or any other one that is more cardioselective will be preferred. I talked about Vecronum earlier. I said 
Yes, it's cardio stable, but it has a tendency to slow the heart. And that is why it's employed in cardiac surgery so that you will not have any undue tachycardia with it. That is, that, that is about Vecuronium. Okay, thank you very much. Somebody is also asking that the common ECG leads comprise left, right hand, foot, central, and neutral. Which lead is that? This does not seem to be a very clear question, too. It's not clear. <laughs> what, not clear. Maybe you should take it. Uh, please, I, 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 please, can I ask the question? Okay, Dr. Tweta, please go ahead. Yes. Please, what I want to, I want, I, I meant to say there is that, thank you, sir, for the lecture. What, what I meant to say there is that most um, ECG that comes with the monitors that we use in the theater, they comprise of the left hand, right hand, then the, the foot, the left foot, then you have the central lead, and then we have the neutral. At least that's what I'm using. You, you made mention of, um lead lead two and the and v5 being very good in detecting arrhythmias so i'm just asking because when you apply this ecg on patient you get the rhythm which rhythm are you actually reading on yeah. your screen when, when you, apply you understand those, the question yeah 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 to some extent when you apply those five lead ecgs on your patient okay it's going to give you on your monitor, it will yes. give you lead one, two, three, and V1 to V6. That's what it's going to give you. Okay. Unlike when you apply the that uh, is not it. just what when you apply, okay, you want to say something. What do you see on your monitor so when the you apply it? In practice, we have one or two tracings. In fact, most times one. No, One, no, um, no, 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 no. Tracing is what you find. No, no, no you can't. If you, if that, if you no. look onto that, check that yeah. monitor. Check that monitor. Moment. You can see yeah, all the leads. Lead one, two, three, yeah. and V one to six, V six. You can get it from that monitor. From that five leads, you can get it. Check your monitor okay, again. The, okay, that's what you. But but the one that's when you have when you search for it. But the one that appears on the screen usually is you, they are usually one at most two you, that you, appears on that. You will, screen. you will, de you will determine, you will determine what you want to see on the screen. Okay. You can just select. Yes, yeah, you can just select. You can just select. View all, view all, yes. all leads. To show all the leads. Just go to view all leads. Exactly. Okay. Uh -huh, that's what you do. Okay. Mm. And, and then let me and let me contribute Thank something, you. sir. Uh, for for cardioversion, actually you can use also 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg. In contrast to uh, uh, VFIP, which you can use between one to two, two to three, two to four milligram per kg to a maximum of ten milligram, uh, ten juice per kg. For for, for cardioversion, a maximum of four juice per kg is recommended. That's an AHA recommendation. Thank you. Thank and you. Then, that's also, good. let me also say that. Um, in anesthetizing a patient with perioperative arrhythmia, comment on general anesthesia versus um, regional. Any advantage? <laughs> it, 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 no, it depends on the. You will not. You will not add, uh, see a patient who has a arrhythmia, or I mean, and you want to anesthetize. So if you follow the principle of correcting if there are problems in the patient, ensuring that you take care of that. Either you, whether you are giving general anesthesia, you are giving regional anesthesia, the risk of you having intraoperative arrhythmia is there. So I have not done any research and I've not seen any meta-analysis that really compare these two in terms of perioperative arrhythmia. But I think it depends on the type of patient you're actually handling. If you have a patient with pre, I mean, preoperative uh, um, uh, cardiac diseases, okay, or patient with preoperative, uh, uh, um, I mean, I, I'm, who is hypertensive, who's had some issues with the heart, and the patient now develops maybe hypertension, it can predispose the patient to developing 
any form of arrhythmia. Or the patient, you you maybe for one reason or the other, you end up using your uh, uh, vasopressor and you are not careful with it. Patient can end up developing some, I mean, take arrhythmias that you are not, you're not going to be happy with. So I think it depends on the patient you have and you that you are managing the patient. I think what we should do is just look at uh, what people have done and see whether they've compared regional and general and see whether which one is actually associated with more perioperative arrhythmia, okay? Uh, I can't say for sure, but the truth is that it depends on the patient and the care you're offering your patient. That's, all, that's, that's what I'll say. Thank you very much. Um, may I also say that to that question, the type of surgery also matters because definitely some surgery types will not be amenable to regional anesthesia of any sort. So uh, you have to consider this also in relation also to the risk versus benefit. But overall, our speaker has told us that um, um, there is not aware of any studies, meta-analysis on that. So maybe we all need to also check on that. Okay, moving forward, um, Dr. Schneike, please. Uh, we have this question that says, do you know anywhere to get phosphate magnesium, magnesium phosphate injection? or tablets in Nigeria. That's, for, that's coming from our- Magnesium doctor. phosphate. Yes. Phosphate magnesium. Magnesium sulfate is available in different- ah. Doctor Sorry, Stanky. I didn't get the question. Yeah. Sulfate or phosphate, which one? Which one is, is which phosphate one? is available? Uh, magnesium sulfate. sulfate for magnesium uh, phosphate combination. Sometimes you have most patients in ICU have uh, some of them have uh, they have recalcitrant cardiac arrest. Sometimes you will need to correct their magnesium or with phosphate. So we've been trying to find places we can get. All you can have is the best is magnesium. But I've not seen any okay, besides okay. well vast. So I feel probably you will have idea where they can get supply. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think you can try. I don't want to advertise companies here, but uh, <laughs> I, Alpha can help. Alpha has been helping with a lot of drugs, so maybe you can try Alpha. Thank you, okay. Dr. Shinaki. I agree with you. It's not an issue of advertising. We all know that Alpha Pharmacy is our key pharmaceutical company as far as anesthesia is concerned in Nigeria. So I was going to say that too. Thank you very much. And um, well, I think this is also a good question because you have said that drugs availability is very key in management of them, antiarrhythmics. Thank you, thank you. The next question says, those of cardioversion is... Yeah. Okay, I think somebody has already... Dr. Rabi has already stated this. I won't go through it. Okay, somebody yes. says... Dr. Dr. Fazua has responded. Pulseless VT is cardiac arrest. If there is a pulse, then it's not cardiac arrest. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Sure, sure. Uh, Pulseless VT is cardiac arrest. Sure. Mm. Okay. Dr. Sarah Beckley is telling us that um, cardiostat in Abuja does ablation. That is to responding. That is responding to the question on where ablation. Okay, that's happen. good. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Beckley. Um, okay. 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 We are we are we are coming to the end. Somebody says, how do we manage? Patients with cardiac pacemakers who develop arrhythmias under anesthesia. Another one says, um, okay, Sarah is actually um, contributing to your answer to the um, use of ECG leads. She said with a five lead, you can change your monitor settings to choose which leads you show, which you had already responded to Dr. Oshinaiki. All right, um, now somebody says, hmm. All right, um, Sarah is still telling us that um, Sando phosphate comes like Sando K, slow K, maybe worth checking if it's available in Nigeria. I guess that's what she means. Okay, Dr. Schneider, please, can you respond to those two? Yeah, there is just one, co one, co one question, cardiac pacemakers and um, arrhythmia. I, I, I think the important thing is to uh, understand what type of arrhythmia the patient has. What is it? The pacemaker is there most of the time to improve the rate, okay? And um, if a patient develops arrhythmia, 
identify the arrhythmia. Is it a tracheal arrhythmia? Is it a bradyarrhythmia? arrhythmia? And treat as such. It's possible that the pacemaker has failed and patient can develop a, 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 a terrible bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia on you. And for that, you can use your atropine, use your uh, dopamine or epinephrine while you get ready to replace the pacemaker. Okay, that is um, if it's, it's available, readily available. Okay, or if it's a tracheal arrhythmia, then you, you treat as such. Okay, so because the patient has a pacemaker does not mean you can't offer them uh, uh, appropriate care. I mean, there's there's I mean there, there's no there's there, there's no limitation. I mean, important is just identify the arrhythmias and treat as appropriate. That's what I think. Thank you very much. Um, I think in the absence of um, any more questions, I think um, we have really dealt with this subject exhaustively, signifying that it is an all too important topic for us as anesthetists as we can come across. Let me, ask, let me Dr. Briggs, let me, let me make comment on something I saw on the chat now. Okay. Hello, hello, ma. Yes, please go ahead. I, 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 I use of, okay, the president is on the floor. Uh, no, please, sorry, Dr. Sinake, please go ahead. I'm just getting ready. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I saw so, I saw somebody who wrote that use of magnet can correct arrhythmias. That is that statement is too general. Uh, magnet may help to reprogram the pacemaker, but it doesn't suggest that it can treat or it can correct arrhythmias. So I think we should get it clear. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to go back to the president. Professor Elizabeth Tinwas. Uh, very much, Nike, for that very detailed and very uh, lucid presentation. It's all confusing, it can be a medical dilemma for us as anesthetists. Thank you for coming into the digital part and making it so easy to understand. Really appreciate you, and then thank our moderator. We've had a very good time, and that's a good time to come back to the presentation. What I want to say is that um, we are going to continue with our series. Uh, we encourage our participants not to leave until it's over. Um, during this time, we are going to also ask for feedback from our comments or we can um, keep the floor open for the next five to ten minutes while we listen to uh, our participants. We also want to encourage our residents. This is um, with the aim of helping our residents to be able to uh, understand the grasp of uh, clinical anesthesia and also to help in the preparation for the exams. But it's not just about the exams, it's also about how we manage our patients on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, uh, having said that, I also want to make some housekeeping announcements that uh, we are going to be sharing the account details of the NSA during this time for members who want to renew their membership and also for those who want to uh, join as new members, uh, this is the right time. So we'll ask um, the secretariat and the treasurer to put up the information in the chat box so that uh, members can see it and uh, respond appropriately. Also, uh, we want to ask if there is anybody who would like to add some topics or who would like some topics to be taken, you can communicate with Dr. Briggs. She's our moderator for today, and she's also the coordinator of this uh, seminar webinar series so that she can give more information or she can accommodate um, the series 
um, the topics or the suggestions that are being made. So uh, back to you, Dr. Briggs. Can we take comments? If there's anybody that wants to make a comment, they can put up their hand. And uh, let's not forget, we are going to have a photo shoot at the end to, uh, to see the faces, the sights and sights of today's uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Please don't go away. Do not leave yet. This last five minutes is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, my friend. Thank you, Vice President. Yes, um, I'd like to reiterate something you have already said. Please, we would like to have comments right away on um, ways we can improve these sessions from us. We need your contributions. We want a very good delivery for um, effective um, participation and benefit. Thank you. Something already on the platform. I can see something on pulmonary activity. I think. Um, Anybody that wants to comment can raise their hands and uh, the floor is open. Uh, Dr. Amkar, you want to say something? Okay. Um, President. Yes. Somebody is um, asking that, uh, well, private chat to me that um, can I submit this topic on pulmonary artery catheterization? Okay. Um, that may actually come under invasive uh, monitoring. Monitoring. So yes, I, um, I think it's taking. We'll factor that in. Okay. In the next okay. series, when we we'll do a subject on the um, okay. because it has been a question that has been featuring in the exams, and uh, I think it would be nice if we can have somebody to take up that um, in the next year. Like you said, that will be in four weeks' time or so. So, uh, Dr. Gaffar, you want to say something? Hello? No, not really, ma. Okay. Not really, ma. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm in the theater right now. Okay. So I can't contribute much. Like I said, I want my lecture to be postponed by one week. Yes, yes, we are working on that. Yes. I have already put the All information right. out. So you will right. be Thank you, possibly on the 20th, 20th well, March, if that's okay by you. You'll be taking the 20th instead of the 13th, if that's okay by you. Well, it was supposed to be on the 20th. To be on the, the next week, so we'll work it out. Don't worry, there'll be no problem about that. Thank you for that. That's Dr. Gaffar, he's one of the consultants and anesthetists with us at ABUT Zaria. Okay, thank you. So, I will want the recording of the uh, presentation. I want to assure you that the recordings will be on YouTube and uh, uh, an NSA channel, and also. We will have it uh, on. Sent mail. Uh, Dr. Briggs, can you read out the account details for us or type it somewhere? Why so we close? Why we close? Which account, please? The NSA account details that is to be put up for the members to see. For those that want to pay the dues or to join as new members. Okay, we'll do that in a moment. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we are going to sign up now, if in the absence of any corrections, after the account details are, pay, are put up. Uh, subsequently, subsequently, uh, there is a, a comment in the chat. 
asking Dr. Sinaike for the presentation. Yes, somebody is asking for us to look at front of neck access dialysis for the critically ill. So this is another suggestion by Dr. Saheni. So uh, we have the NSA account details. It's been pasted uh, by the secretary. Please kindly uh, make your payments uh, appropriately. Is factors affecting uptake of inhalational agents and this block by Dr. Velo uh, Galadima from uh, Uzu Sokoto. And uh, the, up, the factors affecting uptake of inhalational agents will be taken by Dr. Irene Akideno. And that this, these two topics will be taken next uh, Saturday on the 10th DV by God on the 13th of March. So make it a date with us and uh, put it in your calendar to be there. Do not miss it. We are going to also take um, cognizance of the topics that have been suggested and we'll start featuring those topics in April. Uh, thank you very much. We thank all the participants. So, um, I don't know. Do we do closing prayers or what do we do at the end of it? Moderator. We thank everybody and bid them goodbye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank God bless. You. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, everybody. President of the Intelligence website, you can hook on to pay link and pay your dues online. It's 10,000 naira for fellows and uh, diplomates, and it's um, 5,000 for residents, I think. And then life membership is 100,000 naira for those that are eligible for life membership. So thank you for joining us once again. I'm going to start our program now. Everybody leave. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm going to take the pages of those that are on and I take some shots. Uh, Dr. Davy Akubo, the NSA treasurer, is on now. Dr. Akubo, you want to say yes. what? Yes, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone for attending uh, this webinar. We highly and uh, I want to recognize the president of the Christian Society of Nigeria. Uh, uh, thank you to our speaker today. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Okay, please, if, if you can put my so, okay, nice to see all of you. Uh, so, Barra, all the people from Calabar, uh, are you in Calabar or you? You are muted, you are muted, madam. You are muted. Thank you, ma. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, NSC. Oh, thank you, thank you. 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 Thank you.
He's been in Saudi. Thank you. Okay, right. Yeah, I just left off. I listen, I actually, I, I, I listen to it at home. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Dr. Daniel, how are you? Hello, ma. Hello, ma. Yeah, I can hear you, ma. Hello, ma. Yeah, thank you for being with me. Okay, thank you, ma. Thank you, ma. Thank you, ma. Thank you, Yes, ma. 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 Thank you for joining us. <coughs> Dr. Onyeka, we are hoping that you will take your lecture with us. So you will give us one of the sessions. Oh, yes. Okay, we are looking at Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Awesu. We can see you, Dr. Shoyemi. We can see you. 
Thank you very much. Madam President. Please, who is Ligita Gao? What's your true identity? Dr. Ibrahim is here. Oh, Dr. Ibrahim. How are you? Yes, ma. Madam Ma. See you. Are you one of the Well, we are going to have a nice see you now. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, nice to see you. Well done. Thank, Thank you, ma. Thank you, sir. Okay. Please, if we didn't capture you, Dr. It's been in the background. Dr. Jeremiah, Dr. Kuforiji, and yes, Dr. Jebi, thank you for your question. That was very incisive. It's a critical dilemma, actually. Something that comes up once in a while. But, uh, you know, you have all it takes to manage it. So just be composed. And with the tidbits you have been given today, I believe you can do it. Yes, Thank you, Dr. Lucy. Yes, all right. Oh, wow. Hello, Dr. Aman Ali. Do you want to say something? Hello, Hello. Hello, Dr. Gabriel. How are you? Are you there, Dr. Fuerke? I can hear you. You want to say a word or two? Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, who is speaking, please? Oh, Mustafa Miko, our fellow financial secretary. Yes, ma'am. He's he's cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Very great. Dr. Sheikh Ahmed, Dr. Astro, Hello, ma. Good afternoon. Yes. Yes, ma. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was you. I hope you had a session. Thank you. Dr. Toro, we'll be asking you to give us some very soon. We'll be asking you to give us some lectures very soon. Okay, ma'am. I hope you will be able to uh, oblige us one of these days. There are some topics that are challenging, will be questioning for your assistance. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. So, thank you, everybody. It's five minutes to five. I have thank to you, sign off now. I have to sign off. Uh, okay, Lois Alungwa. Chingwe Tomaihe, Dr. Happy Apo, oh, Alpha. Oh, Dr. Alpha, how are you? How are you, Dr. Alpha? Dr. Idris. Hi, ma. Hi, ma. Dr. Oh, Alpha from Kano. Yes, nice to see you. Yes, ma. I know you've been with us. Yes, ma. Yes, ma. Okay, ma. President of Lagos and Cities Association. Hello, Dr. Fabio. Ah, Dr. Hamisu. Many of our people are here. Good afternoon, Dr. Lola. How are you doing? Good afternoon, ma'am. Fine, thank you, ma'am. Thanks for the beautiful presentations they are having, ma'am. And I say you do very well. Take one of our lectures in due course. I hope you, you will oblige us. Yes, ma. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So, we, we
wish everyone enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your weekend and uh, wishing you all the best in the new week and the week. I, I will soon sign out. So. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you ma, for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes, Hope you.